The word cove brings to mind someplace hidden and sheltered. And for more than a hundred years, that was the case in Cades Cove, as families carried on their way of life, farming the land and living in this mountain community. J.C. McCauley spent the early years of his childhood in Cades Cove, and he and his wife Margaret have collected many of his memories in their book, A Cades Cove Childhood. The McCauleys were kind enough to spend some time with visitors recently to share stories and recollections from a childhood that many could only imagine. J.C. McCauley's father, John, was born in the Tipton Cabin, which still stands near the Loop Road in Cades Cove. John was the son of a Civil War veteran, James McCauley, who rented the cabin at the time. John would live on to raise his own family with his wife, Rutha, in the western end of the cove, near Forge Creek Road. One day, John came home and said to Rutha, well, uh, I bought us a farm. He had sold used their entire savings of a hundred dollars and they still owed 50. And he hasn't talked to her about it. Ruth was in absolute despair. Their money was gone and they owed 50 dollars. This would have been in 1908, I believe. That was a serious sum of money and it was going to take them a long time to pay for it. She burst into tears and cried that they would starve to death. Which, if, if John hadn't been so good at turning a dollar and um, a farmer and a hunter and everything else, they probably would because although her parents were quite well off and had a very good farm, he wasn't very good about helping out his children. The only thing that was on that piece of property was a very primitive little log cabin. Uh, the first time we ever walked up and had a look at that, I, I looked at how big that was. and. Nowadays, that would fit comfortably in my living room. <laughs> and when they moved in there, they had two children already, and they lived there long enough that they had five more children. <laughs> so they had two adults and seven children living in that little <laughs> tiny cabin. Margaret described her husband's father as a resourceful, hardworking man who was an excellent hunter and found ways to provide for his family. Farming was a way of life, but money was hard to come by. He sold apples, honey, and raccoon skins, served as a guide for camping and hunting parties, and was even employed at different times by TVA and the CCC. Once, he guided an Alcoa Aluminum Company executive on a hunting and camping trip. At seeing how hard John McCauley worked to make a living, the executive decided to give him a job at the plant. John worked there for a while, but it didn't last very long. Mr. McCauley could not stand being, as he would put it, hemmed up in four walls. And I'm sure he had to lodge at Maryville and go home on the weekends on that job. This also was in the 20s. Stylish young men at that time wore coats made of raccoon skins. And he said, mm -hmm. I can stay home and trap enough raccoons by dinner time and then I can farm in the afternoon. So he quit his Alcoa job and went back home and that is what he did. Um, at that time you could get about nine dollars for a good raccoon skin. Nine dollars would buy you a lot of groceries in the 20s. Also, raccoon is a kind of a multi-purpose thing. You can sell the hide and then you can eat the raccoon. But the time I was old enough to remember very much, a lot of people had already moved from the cold. People were moving out quite fast. All this was before Laurel Creek Road was built. The only way in and out was across Rich Mountain into Sunshine. And my dad used to pick, he would uh, get apples out on Parsons Branch Road. There was some big uh, orchards out there. He would load his wagon uh, the night before with, with hay and, and uh, apples. And uh, he'd leave about four o'clock the next morning going to Knoxville. He would get to Vestal and stay all night and then go on into Market Square the next morning, and, and hopefully he'd sell out by by uh, by dark, and he'd get back to a vegetable and then on back home the next day. It's three day three day trip, and they used to get back before the S chestnut tree died. Him and two of my sisters went up on the mountain after lunch one day, and they picked up seven bushel of chestnuts and sacked them up and he took the mules back next day and ordered them in and took them to Knoxville. 
Back then, you just had to make a nickel wherever you could find it. Dad was a pretty good storyteller, and he never cracked a smile. <laughs> he was to taking a, a group to Gregory's Ball once. He had two mules to the burial, and he would pack these people up, and if they wanted, he would stay and cook and whatever. But he was behind in the trail, uh, and he caught up to two ladies sitting resting on a big rock. And uh, they she stopped and chatted with them a bit. And one of them says, is there any snakes up here? And he said, yeah, there's some timber rattlers, occasional copperhead, but that's about it. <laughs> well, one of them said, what would happen? What would you do if you got bit? Well, he said, you can just swallow two grasshoppers backwards and then just <laughs> kill that stuff. Poison a little bit. <laughs> he never said a word. He said it just went on. They never questioned this. <laughs> In the summertime, I was out of the house right after breakfast. I always found something to do. Well, I was up on these big, one of these big rocks you were talking about one day playing around, and I saw some brush piled up on it that I hadn't seen before. So I pulled the brush back, and there was a little. A uh, little wooden wooden keg about that long, laying down in there, and it had a cork in the top, and there was a piece of a cane to lay in there for a, to break out of, I guess. So I took the cork out, and man, that smelled good. <laughs> so I tried a little, see what it was like, and then I tried a little more, and several trips I made with back to the keg. <laughs> I'm about six or seven years old, but my mother hollered for me to come, yell for me to come to supper. And she saw me a coming and she said, there's something wrong. She said, I was taking two steps sideways and one forward. <laughs> but she said, what, in the, what is the battery you do? And I said, I found a keg up there that's just full of blackberry juice. <laughs> and what had happened, my older brothers had picked a bunch of blackberries and made them some blackberry wine. <laughs> they had orders to move the keg. <laughs> a lot of Sunday afternoon pastime for the older, older boys. Rich Mountain Road is very crooked. They would go up, a bunch of them would go up on Sunday afternoon, and not too many cars would come along, but if the car come on, there's about five or six switchbacks like that. They'd go up at the top and just be standing waving to the car that went by. Well, when the car would go out to go way out around there and back, <laughs> and they would go straight down and be waving again. <laughs> People are looking at one another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they had to make their own entertainment. <laughs> J.C. McCauley's childhood memories of running through the woods barefoot, fishing for minnows in clear streams, and finding some occasional mischief to get into are priceless remnants of the place Cades Cove once was. Today, visitors come from all over to experience this peaceful setting where wild nature and human history are on display. No longer is the cove a hidden place, but one of the most visited places in all the national parks. But for those who remember it as it was, and for their descendants, Cades Cove will forever be a part of them. You can get a copy of A Cades Cove Childhood, remembered by J.C. McCauley and written by Margaret McCauley, at our website, www.smokiesinformation.org, or at visitor centers throughout the park. <laughs>